play. And another, another foul on board. This third for setting a screen. Because of physical play, although Jordan Taylor just got caught with a moving screen. Hizzo's dying for a moving screen. It's that dreaded hey guys, moving it's screen. Uh, I totally forgot to uh, tease the fact that we are going to be having a conversation with former Big Ten Associate Commissioner of Men's Basketball, Rick Boyages, um, to add some insight into how officiating works. We've uh, we've heard you on Twitter, and we know that uh, everyone's very curious about the state of officiating in the Big Ten. And we think Rick can probably add more context to that than anyone. So stay tuned for that on the second half of the show. Cheers. Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Moving Screen Pod. I'm Brendan Quinn here with Dylan Burkhart. Dylan, uh, uh, moving into mid-January, I had a question in my mailbag uh, this morning. We're going to just, right now, we're calling our shots over under eight and a half NCAA tournament bids for the Big Ten. I will go with the over. I would I, I would set the same number, but I would take over. Yeah, you know, and I feel like the instinct is to say, Oh, under the league's not that good. These teams are, are it's all a bunch of middling teams beating each other. Uh, and then you take a step back and you realize they got nine last year while rated third among the conferences on Ken Palm. And the thing is built to produce NCAA bids. But this is kind of an entry point into saying, you know, is it is it still Purdue and eight teams battling for uh for NCAA bids because that's really what it's starting to feel like. Starting to feel like it might be twelve teams battling for NCAA bids at this. Well, point. I mean, I, okay, like, twelve teams battling for eight bids. tournament spots. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's really what it feels like. And Minnesota's just sitting there watching everyone go by as they fall down, 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 down. They, you lose at home to Nebraska already, man. Like that's the one thing you have to play for if you're Minnesota. I think that's going to get pretty bad because. All like Indiana and Illinois are one and three in the league. Yeah. That's where we're at. Northwestern looks legitimately good. Nebraska looks very competent. They're going to be very hard to beat at home. Like there's no free squares. There's no easy wins. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll see in the end, a lot of very solid NCAA tournament resumes for a lot of these teams, even if they're not maybe, Oh wow, this is a final four contender, whatever else. Right. They're still going to get, just by winning these games against good teams, they're all slightly NCAA tournament qual- caliber teams. You win those games, your resume starts to build up, and all of a sudden, wow, all these Big Ten teams have twice as many quality wins as Pac-12 and ACC teams. Well, okay, they're going to get more Ooh. bids. Exactly. And uh, ha- have we started the soft bubble conversation? Are we there yet? Uh, is it, Have we hit that point in the season? Is it? A, I feel like it could be a... A hard bubble. Like the, the problem is the whole Big Twelve might get in the NCAA tournament too. Like that's the other thing. Like Baylor and Texas Tech are in last place in the Big Twelve right now. Where would Texas Tech and Baylor be in the Big Ten this year? <laughs> Baylor's looked a little rockier than expected. I think Texas Tech fits in with the rest of these Big Ten teams. I feel like where they're yeah, they have some things you like, but I think Baylor would be a cut above. I think if you put Baylor in this league, they'd be in that second group fight, nipping at Purdue's heels more than in this sort of slog. I think there's just enough talent same, there. But same there's team that beat UCLA and Gonzaga. Yeah, well, they also lost to who? They, they have some losses on their resume too. Like they've they're not playing that well lately. I mean, they yeah, their worst I loss think, is home to TCU, which is which like preseason top fifteen team. But the point being. um yeah, I don't know what they're going to do with the Big 12, but those bottom teams, like all you need to do in the Big 12 is get to probably eight or seven, and you got, you're probably in damn near. So, but like if, you know, if Baylor or Texas Tech goes, uh, you know, five and 13 or six and 12, then, then that conversation's over. But um, you wanted to talk a little Purdue at the top. We're going to get in, we're going to hit on a number of teams. I like that you mentioned Northwestern. I'm going to talk some Northwestern. Are they good or are is this a product of right teams at the right time and we're Ooh. being sold a bill of goods by Northwestern again? But um, we're going to get into all that. But you you wanted to start this week with 
Purdue, who I want to say at this time last week was coming off a loss to Rutgers at home. Um, and we were starting to question a little bit of, uh, you know, OK, is this is this Purdue dropping back? You know, you can't drop home home games if you want to win the Big Ten in theory. Um, and they just did. But then they came right on back, win at Ohio State in a two point game um, and then looked really good uh, against Penn State in uh, what is called a semi away game or a neutral court. But in reality, was a, a great home environment for Penn State. Yeah. So a little bit of luck in there. Right. Ohio State. Zed Key gets hurt a couple minutes into mm-hmm. the game. That could be pivotal because. In a two-point game. Yeah, not just – and a game that Ohio State really had and Purdue stole at the end. So – and that that just also – that was not just a win that Purdue stole, but Ohio State then went and lost another game without key. So pretty key injury there. Yeah, yeah, you like that? Uh, But – Man, uh, man, you should be a writer. (laughs) But I think that you look at Purdue, we were like, now they're right in the mix with everyone else a week ago. Now they're projected to finish 15-5 and on Ken Palm. That's three wins clear of anyone else in the league. They're probably going to be favored in every game they play from here on out. Um, if you look through their Kempom page, there's only really one game in the like single possession range, which is at Indiana. And I feel like Purdue's kind of owned Indiana of late. Mm. All of a sudden, they look like poised to run away with it. Now, obviously, that could all change in a couple weeks. They do play three of their next five games away. But they're going to be done with, what, six road games in, of their 10 before the end of the month. All of a sudden, if they win a couple of those, it's looking like they might actually be this cut above. And this, the stat I had that I wanted to kind of hit on is we talk about their offense, right? They're, mm-hmm. They just throw it to Zach Eady. They have this guard play that's been really good. They have the second best offensive rebounding team in the country. But I think their defensive improvement this year is is a bit sneaky. And the one stat that really stands out to me is that they allow the fewest percentage of shot attempts at the rim in college basketball. Makes Which, sense. It makes sense, but <laughs> yeah, right. it's a really yeah. useful stat. And I think yes. if you look, they do that while also ranking first in the country and not fouling. So just Zach Eady standing there with his arms up makes it right. impossible for people to shoot at the rim. And I think there's probably even room for them to get better defensively when you consider how few shots at the rim they're giving up and that they're only 54th in two-point defense. Like, that means teams are probably hitting a fair number of tough shots against them as it is, but they're not getting good shots. So I I think this team actually has some potential defensively um, to even get well, better as the year goes on. I would, I would add to that, you know, the dynamic. Uh, so, right, er, most programs in the country right now, when with efficiency being the, the stuff that drives everything, are talking two things. You want three point shots, you want shots at the rim, right? Mm-hmm. So, Purdue's obviously doing a great job and not even allowing shots at the rim, let alone giving up shots at the rim. And then on top of that, a year after letting teams um, shoot, let me pull this up. Um, Sorry. Ranking 156th in three point um, percentage allowed this year, improving to 29% allowed. So your three point defense is better. You're not allowing shots at the rim. Um, This probably goes into some personnel stuff, right? Taking a guy like Stefanovic out of there. Um, a guy like you know, Isaiah Thompson, I don't remember him being, was he a good defender? I don't, I don't remember the Purdue's perimeter breakdown defensively last year. Taking Jaden Ivey out of there. Taking Jaden Ivey out of there, right? Like Jaden Ivey wasn't so, really about that life on defense. Yeah, he, when you're he, leaking out every time. Yes, exactly. Um, leaking out for a team that was, uh, ranking like in the two fifties in tempo is quite a move, but, um, yeah, like point being, if you want to talk like what do you like about Purdue non Zach Eady categories um, or a reason to buy it, the defense is probably uh, up there, which is, you know, Not I think when you expect th- No. And w- it's funny when you think of like Matt Painter, right. You think of like really good, clean, efficient offense and like really strong, solid defense. That's historically what it was. And then there was a drop off in recent years right um but you look historically and it's 
his best teams were top 25 defenses nationally yeah early um, painter was great defense recent painter mm-hmm. has been great offense so like that first but, half it's basically split between the three years where they were terrible or like yeah. the two years where it kind of just everything fell apart but those early teams with hummel and the like like those teams were elite defensively didn't really run right. much great offense now it's been all the carson edwards the bigs just these crazy offenses where the defense hasn't always been there mm-hmm. yeah i agree yeah and you know they've like kind of going a little bit back like this is kind of probably closer to those like isaac haas you know where he was what seven six right and you probably i I don't know the numbers but i imagine it was a lot of (laughs) uh good luck getting shots at the rim you know with isaac haas out there and then he had a dude like vincent edwards who was just you know an absolute dog um getting it done so this is probably closer to that as opposed to what we've seen in the last two years um Anything else that you like about Purdue before I ask you my my big picture Purdue question? That Purdue team with Isaac Haas as a senior? No, no, no. Matt no, no, Painter's no. best uh, Purdue Ken Pump team, just for the record. Oh, is that right? Interesting. Yeah. Obviously, they lost, Haas gets hurt in the NCAA tournament. They lose in the Sweet 16, but that was his best team on paper. So, but what do you have anything to my, my question? What do you like about Purdue non- um, Oh. Or beyond Edie, beyond the defense. I mean, it's hard to argue with how well Braden Smith has played these last couple of games. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just makes tough plays every time down the court, uh, doing everything they need of him. Like, it just seems like it fits in. He made some huge plays late against Ohio State. Um, like, tough to really argue with what they're getting out of both him and Lawyer, which was supposed to be a huge question entering this year right like right. people were trying to tell me that david jenkins was going to be their point guard well <laughs> I, I was right that he is not good enough to be their starting point guard but i did not know that Braden smith and foster lawyer were going to be so steady yeah fletcher lawyer uh, sorry that's going to be a and, bad and, and you know, Braden's just really good I, I mean i love him and you know fletcher just has whatever that thing is that like he just makes big shots he like he's a moment guy um love watching him play too but if we want to talk big picture purdue all right this was also from from the mailbag looked this up yesterday the juicy Uh, mailbag that's right it is it is make sure you uh subscribe to the athletic folks um brayden smith's playing 73 percent of available minutes fletcher lawyers playing 68 percent of available minutes right now there was a period back um early 2010s when it was totally common for teams with multiple key freshmen to go to the final four right from 2011 to 2016 it was Kentucky did it Michigan did it Duke did it UConn did it over and over and over again one team since 2016 has reached the final four with two or more players playing over 60% of available minutes one since 2016 now if you want to do the trivia question i'll give you a guess it's not gonzaga is it no it was duke last year uh paulo and trevor keels Mm -hmm. um but but think about that right so since 2016 only one team with two freshmen playing over 60 percent of the minutes have made the final four and Purdue has two guys playing 68 and 73 percent. Not only that, but these aren't athletic wings or or big guys. Um, You know, these are your guards. These are your lead guards. These are guys who are going to have the ball in their hands in March for the first time. Is that any level of concern to you in terms of like your long term buy on Purdue? How many times does a team with a national player of the year get to the final four? Like, that's what I come back. Like, it's fair. It's, it's, I, I mean, that's I, the I made that, like, that's that the point difference. here that Edie is his own thing and he's the total outlier. Um, but I don't think you can ignore a lack of experience in March. That's I, Yeah, that's completely fair. I think the much bigger concern beyond just experience is that they haven't been an elite three-point shooting team. Um, they're at 243rd mm-hmm. in the country. And like the way you stop this offense is going to be just throw your entire team at Zach Eady. Hope you can make him uncomfortable. It hasn't really worked for anyone yet, but, and then hope the shots don't go in. And the reason Rutgers is such a great matchup for them 
is because the Rutgers game plan is basically to swarm the ball, make everything miserable, use lots of length, and hope that you don't lose on catch and shoot threes. Mm-hmm. Okay, Purdue shoots 30%, loses that game. Like that's how this team loses in the postseason to me. Um, and I don't if all these guys are shooting 40% from three, you'd say, wow, that's not even gonna happen because they're that great of a shooting team. But Braden Smith's at 44% there's probably going to be some regression there along the way. I mean, mm. He is a freshman. He, like, so I think it's a mix of that, right? The young backcourt, but also not having just elite proven knockdown shooters at the four spots around ED will eventually probably be their undoing in a single elimination tournament. It's fair. Um, yeah, I just, no, no. I, I it's, think it's what, definitely a risk to have those young guys, but they're, they're playing well. Like at a certain point, yeah, no, like March, I get, you're I, almost a sophomore, man. You gotta just, get with it. It's it's just an interesting turn that we've seen in college basketball that like it, it's it is just a becoming a rarity, um, especially at the guard position to even see l- freshman lead guards um taking teams deep in March. It there aren't many. Like if you start going through it, like you you have to go back to like Peyton Pritchard and Oregon to find like starting Suggs. freshman point guards and Suggs. There you go. But like beyond that, there's not there's there's not many. Um, yeah, I, th- I think the one thing that is interesting about that is that highly ranked freshman guards who play a ton of mm-hmm. minutes are usually a very different mold than Purdue's guards, and they have True. like, and they're asked to do more things, right? If you're a starting freshman point guard who was a McDonald's All American, you're going to be using. 25% of your team's possessions, you're going to be the focal point of the offense. And it's hard to do that efficiently as a freshman. Purdue's not asking their guards to do that, right? Like mm-hmm. a lot of what they do is hit open shots and throw the ball seven feet in the air and hope your guy gets it, right? Like, so I think that's part of the, the tricky conundrum there where, okay, like great freshman guards come and go, but it's hard to be a high usage, true freshman and take your team to the final four. Whereas it's not really Braden Smith or Fletcher Lawyer that have to take mm-hmm. Purdue to the Final Four. They just need to make the right plays along the way. Yeah, I mean, I'll just be kind of curious, even as a setup for March, just to watch those guys go through the league a second time, you know, play Ohio State a second time. They play in mid-February again, um, so on and so forth. But these teams getting a second look, getting more film, more, you know, it, I think that'll be an interesting kind of precursor to to watch. Um for Purdue. Let's hit on um Michigan Michigan State, mm-hmm. which I imagine some listeners uh, care about. <laughs> you know, nice win for um Michigan State taking care of business at home. Really, you know, credit to the folks at Breslin. It was a, a pretty good environment for a pretty like subdued game. But man, I t- I tweeted it afterwards. I've been here since 2013. That might have been the least um I don't eventful anything game. And the funny thing is like, you know, I got there a couple hours early and was talking to a bunch of people and blah, blah, blah. And one thing I I kept saying to everyone, I was like, you know, man, I just hope that at the end of the, like nothing happened, nothing dumb happens. And at the end of the game, we're just talking basketball and blah, blah, blah. Cause there's been so much bullshit in this rivalry on both sides and blah, blah, blah. Um, You know, hopefully it's just about the game. Well, man, I got what I asked for, and that sucked. That was really boring. So I don't know. What were your takeaways from uh, Saturday in East Lansing? Yeah, last week when we talked, like the first thing I said was, I'm really not sure if either of these teams are that good. And yeah, that kind of looked like a game between two teams that are pretty mediocre. I mean, credit, like both teams I thought played well defensively, but both teams also just yes. missed a bunch of open shots. Um, it's not like, like Michigan – made two catch and shoot jump shots the whole game. They're both by Hunter Dickinson. Like, okay, the, you're not going to ever beat anyone when they're double teaming Hunter Dickinson and no one makes a catch and shoot jumper the whole game. Um, Michigan state airballed a lot of open Air shots. Ball. Like Joey Hauser yeah. shot the ball terribly. Uh, correct. AJ Hogard. I think he made the mm-hmm. tough shots that you'd want to make him shoot if you're Michigan and he hit some of those, but I don't really come away from that game encouraged by either team it's kind of about what i expect i think they both are these sort of teams kind of in the middle to lower tier of the big 10 i don't really see it didn't 
like if one if someone would win that game convincingly, like Michigan State looks awesome, I'd say like okay, maybe they're moving up. Michigan wins on the road, sure, like they're figuring it out. Instead, it's like kind of status quo for me on both teams. I think they have a lot to figure out. I think they have a path to be competitive in most games, but I'm not really sure what the upside is of either team. And if you look, like it's one of the few games where they both entered that game ranked like outside of the top 35 or whatever in the last Mm -hmm. five, six, seven years. So there was just like the teams aren't as good as they've been. And I think that kind of showed. Yeah. It was the lowest scoring game in the rivalry in 13 years. Like it, it, there was never any momentum. There were never, they were never like trading runs. You know, like the the game just really just kind of lacked a, a pulse. You know, the, there was the double technical early, and the game like it just never had any flow to it. Right? It just it was really herky jerky. It was stop and start. There were reviews. There was this. There was that. Um, yeah, it was just a bad basketball game. Um, I thought Malik Hall deserves some credit. He a guy who's definitely not playing at a hundred percent at all. And then got uh, banged up on the same foot that was previously injured. I guess this was a twisted ankle and previously it was obviously like a metacarpal uh, thing in his foot, but you know, a guy kind of hobbling his way, made the biggest shot in the game when Michigan got it down to four. Um, But yeah, I mean, it was basically, you know, Hogard and and Malik Hall kind of just got it done for Michigan state. And then Michigan just really never had anything going. The big talking point before the game was how Michigan State was going to defend Dickinson, and they went kind of multiple looks, right? They they gave doubled him, him most of the double game. teams. They dug on him. They there was some moments of single coverage, but I think they just wanted to kind of keep it. There's some level of guesswork to a degree of of what was coming on on uh, any given possession. It, at the same time, though, like I really wasn't ready to write a story like man, Michigan State did an incredible job on Hunter Dickinson because he he did miss a lot of shots that, like, he he would make. Um, no, I think the bigger thing is you're going to look great double teaming if all the jump shots don't go in. Like, Michigan had five catch-and-shoot yeah. jumpers off of Dickinson post-touches, and they missed all of them. Like, those are the if you don't make those, <laughs> it's also why I think it was crazy that Michigan State – didn't double more aggressively in this game last mm. year, right? Like mm-hmm. that was clearly, I think the way to play it. And I thought they did a good job. Like it was the right game plan. They basically used um, whoever was guarding Doug McDaniel pretty aggressively in the double. And then they used Hauser quite a bit. Also um, Terrence Williams and Doug McDaniel went what? Especially against the Michigan team three. that ranked 11th in the league in three point shooting last year. Yeah, but like they also gave like if you look back at the game in Ann Arbor last year, well, Terrence Williams hit a couple threes. Uh, right. The threes Terrence Williams took. That's what we said before the game. This game kind of went exactly how I expected. Mm-hmm. Uh, foul trouble in the first half really hurt Michigan. Um, I think that they really like Michigan lost this game in the basically what would be the second quarter where uh, Michigan State went on a run after Jet Howard and Doug McDaniel both had two fouls. Um, those were the guys that you would have circled in the pregame and say first kind of real away game. How do they handle it? Um, both got a little sped up, right? Like you can't get a technical foul in the first couple of minutes. And then, and then all of a sudden you're sitting for 10 uh, jet Howard got kind of caught with a push off. All of a sudden you're sitting for 10 minutes. Like those are things that Michigan doesn't have the margin for error to deal with. And then the game kind of went sideways there in that stretch. Yeah. Um, unrelated to this game, but a point, have we talked about Jet Howard's three point shooting? You are very. You don't like how much he rotates. Is that what you're going to? Okay. Say? Okay. You do like bring that I, up on the pod? I don't know if we brought that up. No. I, I recently had another conversation about it with, with with someone that got me thinking about it more. But um, yes, it does annoy me. Um, <laughs> uh, Indiana, is it yeah. time? We gotta we gotta get right. into the we gotta do this the Hoosiers. And, uh, Look, I know we have a lot of Indiana listeners, um, including some people we know, and uh, I'm with you. You know, Mike Woodson said after the game, no one's going to feel bad for Indiana. I, I I shoot back at that. I do feel bad for Indiana. <laughs> these, these people, these poor people, all they want to do is win and uh, get all hyped up this year. And here they are. It's January 10th. 10 and 5 overall, 1 and 3 in the league with losses to Rutgers, Iowa and Northwestern. Um and yeah, I we've we've said this year after year after year when, you know, either Michigan fans panic or other people 
people panic that there's, you know, there's no reason to panic this early in the year. I'm not ready to say Indiana's going to miss the NCAA tournament. I'm not ready to say this whole thing is shot. But um, how hard are you pressing the panic button on the Hoosiers? So <clears throat> I think the injuries are a pretty huge part of this. No question. Um, Zave, like you go from Xavier Johnson, who like I'm not the biggest fan of, but he's legitimately a good defensive point guard. He played point guard all last year for a great defensive team. And then Race Thompson goes down 10 minutes into that Iowa game. That's kind of the glue of your entire defense. And they just got run off the court defensively from that point on. I mean, the defense was just awful. And like it kind of makes sense. You have a true freshman all of a sudden playing point guard. He's out getting his buckets, but who's playing defense? Trace Jackson Davis mm-hmm. is playing on a hurt back and he's playing like 40 minutes. He had mm-hmm. a ridiculous like, did you see his stat line in that yes. Northwestern game? 18 points, 24 rebounds, eight assists, four blocks. Just incredible. But the reality 40 is, minutes. The reality is that this team can't really defend right now. And that was supposed to be kind of what made Indiana Indiana. That was supposed to be Indiana's floor. And the floor is not there. I think it's scary to lose those games when Jalen Hood Shafino goes 10 of 15 from three, because I don't yep. think that's going to be something you can count on. Uh, I don't know. Like, there's no real injury update for Race Thompson. It didn't look great. Uh, Xavier Johnson, I think, is out an extended period of time. I'm not sure if there's really a set date, but it starts to get scary in a hurry there. And even, like, I think they'll be a good team if they get some guys back healthy, but it might be too late if you keep stacking up losses right like going to penn state this week penn state desperately needs a win that's an awful spot uh wisconsin at home not really been a matchup that indiana fares well in just gets ugly here quick if you don't figure something out i meant to look this up before we recorded um how many possession like what would you guess how many possessions of zone has mike woodson played uh in i guess between last year and through the, like the early stages of this season, have you seen them play a lot of zone? You watch no, a decent amount of Indiana. I have not. Let's see what the stats are. They've played what ten possessions of zone this year. Yeah, I would guess most of that is recently. And I, they played one possession fa- last year. <laughs> there you go. I've always found this a good sign of a desperate coach is just randomly switching <laughs> to zone defense, and we've suddenly seen. It, IU show possessions of zone of late. And that to me, that's that's when I start reaching for the panic button because man, if you want to crawl into the mind of a coach, that's that's a good telltale sign of, of the old like fuck it. We are in trouble. We got to do something completely different that totally goes against our identity. And we probably haven't practiced very much, right? They just spent the entire preseason and early season playing man, and now they're just suddenly throwing zone out there. Not a good sign. Um, yep. Seven of those 10 possessions were in the Northwestern game. There you go. Um, so with, with Hood Shafino, you know, look, I mean, Xavier Johnson was obviously hugely important to this team. There was part of me that wondered when he went down, like, would this actually kind of free them up to kind of just let Hood Shafino become more of a guy, um, a true number two? And like, could that ultimately work out okay? But then Race Thompson going down. You're right. I mean, the their margin for error is now just so slim and they're just there's minutes being given to guys where you're just like, man, that's that's a lot of minutes for that guy who I don't know if he's really, you know, the caliber of player that they're that they're looking for. Um, it's a tough spot. And I'm not sure where this bleeding stops, because if you lose at home to Northwestern with the combined performance of Huchifino and Jackson Davis on on Saturday or on Sunday, um, uh, what happens when they don't play great? Yeah, and the one thing that Xavier Johnson injury will work out for is Jalen Hutchifino's wallet. Like, he's going to get reps, and he's going to look good, and he's going to help his draft stock, but I just don't know that he can impact sure. winning in the way you need. Uh, but this, this, Go ahead. Go ahead. No, do you have, are you have anything else on IU? Yes. I was going to say, the thing that bothered or distressed me the most about Sunday was how that team took the court to start the game. They looked like they were walking out there. I said this before the show to you. They they looked like they were walking out there to play Central Arkansas in early November 
and just go get a dub and get out of there. And when you're coming off of that performance that they had against Iowa and blowing up what was ever it was 28 to seven lead. And you should be looking to get out on the court as soon as possible to get that taste out of your mouth and go, you know, cram it down someone's throat. And they just went waltzing out there and let Northwestern just come out, start making threes. They're doing whatever they want. Chase Aldiz looks like an all league guard. Like, I'm sorry, man. There, I'm sure there was a line of students outside Assembly Hall that morning looking to get in there and get rowdy. And th- that team slept walked onto the court. And that to me was like, look, beyond the metrics, beyond the lineups, beyond the injuries, that was to me kind of most, I don't know, damning. But quietly, Northwestern's actually pretty good. So yeah, I'm like, ready to talk that, to them, Northwestern. Let's we let's hit on that. They're 12 and three, three and one in the Big Ten. They have wins against Indiana, Michigan State on the road. They beat Illinois. They have had some games where it just all falls apart against Pittsburgh and Ohio State. But like this team is shockingly competitive. They have one of the best two point defenses in the country. I mean, they're not an easy out by any stretch. So I I think they need to at least get a little credit because I think. You don't want to play Northwestern right now. No. So right now they're blocking 16% of the shots they face and they're turning teams over on a quarter of possessions they play. Like, how sustainable? So my question is, is this defense sustainable for the year versus how much of this is maybe a product of playing the the right teams at the right time, right? Michigan State with a hobbled Jade Nakins and no Malik Hall. They played Illinois in the throes of a tailspin. Indiana, obviously, also in a tailspin and without two key, you know, injured players. Um, Northwestern started their Big Ten play 3-0, what, two years ago? And then fell off a cliff. How much of this is sustainable? Is Northwestern for real? So there are some concerns. So they're giving up 41% on twos for the year, which is second best in the country. In four Big Ten games, they're giving up 49% on twos, which is eighth in the Big Ten. Not quite not quite like the dominant two-point defense you want to see. Uh, the turnovers have held up, but I'm a little worried about turnovers as a way to win consistently in the Big Ten just because no one really turns it over. The other concern, 334th in three-point volume allowed. So they're giving up a ton of threes, at, and they're, they're sagging into the paint, taking away the twos, but... Eventually, some of those shots are going to go. And I do think that's why you see some of these lopsided Mm. results, right? Like Pitt hit 14 threes against them. Ohio State hit how many threes? Uh, Only six, but they just kind of – when the offense goes, it goes. They The the three-point volume and the assist numbers they give up feel risky to me on any given given night. But the other thing you can say is, like, they've shot the ball terribly all year, and they're still 12-3. and if if they make a couple shots, they can knock some people off because eventually maybe they make shots, but the shooting numbers are just so ugly. Um, we, but, but we, I mean, we definitely agree that I would rather see 12 and three with this start in the big 10 and it be rooted in defense rather than mm-hmm. they're shooting 48% on threes. And you're like, okay, well they're, they're absolutely going <laughs> to run into a wall soon. Um, you know, if your defensive identity is legit, okay, you can hang on. And, you know, they snagged these early road wins against Michigan State and Indiana. That gives you some leeway, right? When you win a couple games, you're not supposed to. It does give you a little it, – it, I think it adds some reality to the chances of something unexpected happening. Yeah, the tough that thing – That leads me to oh, go their home court. Oh. Okay. Northwestern has to win at home. And it's something that this program plainly has not done in a league where it is a prerequisite. All right. So when you go back to 17, they go, they make the NCAA tournament. They went five and four at home. All right. That was then they have uh, not 17. That was in the um, airport gym, right? Like that wasn't even in. Oh, that's a great point. I completely forgot. I think it was that. that year, right? I don't think they were at home that year. Maybe I'm wrong. I might have it all mixed up. That might be too far. Oh, I, remember, I remember I went to one game when they played out there. That was when Michigan State was down by a million and came back and won. Um, but point being, so in seventeen, no, that they was went, Welsh oh, Ryan. My bad. Okay, throwing off misinfo here. Oh yeah, that was the year. Remember they beat Michigan on the buzzer beater. Yeah, the Derek Pardon, right? The length of the court pass. 
Um, 2017, they go five and four at Welsh Ryan. Not coincidentally, they make the NCAA tournament. Since then, they have not had a winning season in the league at home, and they're 19 and 31 overall against league opponents at home. You got to you gotta protect your court. I'm not saying you got to knock everyone else off, right? But if they go over 500 at home, they can go to the NCAA tournament. So here's the problem. They only play Minnesota once, and they only play mm-hmm. Nebraska once. And the Nebraska game's on the road. Uh, so I it's hard to get get there, I think, just because of those yeah. two stats, right? Like, maybe. I do find it interesting. They are projected to go 10-10 and 10 in the league. This is not a team that's like 3-1 and one and still projected to finish 7-13, and 13, you know? Yeah, they're, they're 53rd in Ken Palm. It's no different than really anyone else. Penn State's 54th. Michigan's yeah. 53, whatever. 50, they're all in the 50s and 40s. Mm-hmm. The whole league is right there. So, I yeah, anything can happen in that sense. I just... I feel like we're going to see some regression coming here. We're going to see a little bounce back, and then we're going to see a late losing streak for them as they they finish three of the last four on the road. That's that's where I think it goes to shit, right? Like if you look in the middle of February, they play Purdue, Indiana, and Iowa back to back to back at home. Uh, that's I feel like where the dream dies. <laughs> like those have to be wins, <laughs> like you say. But then if yeah. they're not, you go three of your last four are on the road against NCAA teams. Tough. Yep. We wanted to hit on two more before we uh, get to the second part of our show, which is a very rare interview Uh on uh, on this on this uh, podcast. Uh, I probably should have teased that at the top. Yeah, probably. We'll be joined by Rick Boyages um, coming up here soon. But last week we went back and forth trying to figure out if Maryland or Iowa were dead in the water. Um, lo and behold, Iowa comes out of nowhere. And and for a fact, right, in the midway through the first half against Indiana, looked like the season was basically over. They come back out of nowhere, win that game, then go to Rutgers, one of the best home court advantages in the league. They get another win by 11. Um, and suddenly 10 and 6, 2 and 3 in the league. Maryland, meanwhile, they come back after um, losing back-to-back Michigan Rutgers. They beat uh, Ohio State, arguably the second or third best team in the conference. Um, they t- take care of the Buckeyes at home. Both have life, and both are kind of still in that bloated middle. Yeah, Iowa took the possum act to like a whole another level where they're like, you think we're dead. <laughs> we're going to go down 23-4 at home and then win. Uh, classic just Fran McCaffrey, Iowa run there. They just start bombing in threes, playing some garbage zone defense, and just all of a sudden everything goes to hell and people are screaming, people are whatever, and then Iowa wins 91-89. Just classic Iowa. And now they're two and three in the league with three straight home games coming up, and it's like, oh, well, maybe they figured it out. I I don't know. Um, Two big wins, though. That kind of changes the whole trajectory for their season, too, because if either of those are losses, really, you're – kind of fighting from behind sure but i think this is going to be what we're going to say every week on this podcast is right okay the team won two games uh you stole a road win all of a sudden you're a contender you lost the home game all of a sudden your entire season is falling apart i think it's just going to be a kind of a bloodbath in the whole middle of the league all year yeah ken palm projections purdue at 15 and 5 minnesota at 3 and 17 everyone else is projected between Eight and twelve wins. Yeah, right. and that's I, fairly plausible. Yeah, I don't see. I don't know why that wouldn't. I there's right. no separation really for me. I think Nebraska could fall a little bit. I'm I'm not completely buying into Maryland beating Ohio State at home as proof that it has life. Like I think Iowa's signs of life are a lot more encouraging than Maryland's personally. Interesting. Uh, Ohio State. Um, on the road without said key. I I don't know. That doesn't give me as much juice as what Iowa was able to do this week. Well, I mean, Maryland has the easiest remaining schedule in the league per Torvik. They've got eight of 15 games remaining at home. Um, have already beaten Illinois and Ohio State there. Uh, they've got two matchups remaining against Minnesota, Nebraska, and Penn State. And their other home games are 
winnable Northwestern, Michigan, Wisconsin. Like Maryland can finish 10 and 10. What are they good at? Doesn't matter. Okay. They have the worst offense in the league in Big Ten games. They turn it over on 21% of their possessions in Big Ten games, worst in the league. Second worst two-point shooting team in the league. Worst assist rate in the league. And the most non-steal turnovers, unforced turnovers in the league. Like, what are we... What? What? I mean, haven't you seen Kevin Willard drag similar Seton Hall teams to middle-of-the-pack finishes in the Big East and NCAA tournament bids? I, I don't know. Like... If Jameer Young can just score 30 points for them to win each game, and that's how they're going to get to 500 in the league, I don't know, man. Like, Dante Scott seems kind of lost. He's struggling. Yeah. I I just don't know if this team has anything to really be excited about compared to – like, Iowa has Chris fucking Murray. He's going to be good. He's, he sure. can win games for you. Who's that guy on Maryland? It's a fair thing, but I mean, they just beat Ohio State um, and they have got the easiest remaining schedule. So like it's, you know, and I put easiest remaining schedule in air quotes because it's probably a pretty slim margin the way the the league is constructed right now. Um, anything else you want to hit on before we get out of here? Any other thoughts from the week that was? No, I think it was a fun week of Big Ten hoops and I think it's setting the stage for a fun year. My uh my my one one thought I jotted down on my notes here for this pod was that we don't talk enough about Mike Woodson wearing Trump with ties. Those things are massive. You could land a plane. You need to just you need to do a whole column on just analyzing the style of every coach in the Big Ten. That's the content that people need. In this post COVID era of some coaches wearing pajamas and others wearing uh you know, quarter zips or um, looking like Patagonia uh, catalogs. Our you're, boy Chris you're Holtman. Style takes. We've left um, talk about golf too long. You're some awesome. guys still wear suits. Who is the best dressed coach in the Big Ten right now? Does anyone like? Wasn't last year their whole thing where Woodson only wore suits for some games and they won games when he wore a suit, and not when he didn't? I feel like that was the narrative last year. I does anyone else? I don't. I don't really feel like there are well dressed coaches in the league. Like who's wearing anything? Bless you, other than uh, dog. Jesus, who's wearing anything other than sort of the quarter zip Nike? Willard. Willard goes full suit. Yeah, I'm not in on anything, Kevin Willard. So I'm not going to throw back in his style. I will say Iowa's coaches' gear always looks sharp. Black is they're coming. Ni- they're, Iowa's Nike gear. Is is sweet because I like that script Iowa. It's sharp. The black is good silver. End up, yeah, the black is nice. It helps. Wear a lot so of black like, when you got stuff. the bright colors with some some people don't need bright colored windbreaker on for two hours oh. on HD TV. It's it's what it is. No, some of the stuff Michigan puts poor Phil Martelli in. Holy hell! I'm like, come on, man. You know, Jesus. I I I think Phil needs to just still wear his old. Italian suits from St. Joe's. So like the whole staff is just in in Jordan brand warmups and then just just fill in, you know, uh an Italian suit that he bought in 2012. <laughs> Give the people what they need. All right. So we'll be, we'll be right back with our guest interview. Uh I feel like we can wrap this up here. I think it's gonna be a conversation. I don't know yeah. if it's gonna be an interview. All right. Our guest conversation. We'll be back soon. All right. All right, everyone. We are thrilled to welcome Rick Boyages on the show. Uh, Rick, former associate commissioner of men's basketball in the Big Ten Conference. How many years did you do that, Rick? Uh, a little over a dozen. A little over a dozen. Before that, a coach, long time uh, coaching college basketball, stops at Ohio State, uh, BC, right? Can you give, you want to, Give us a little rundown of your yeah, basically your coaching I career. Just, just say twenty years. I started off in the small college division three where I played out east in New England, and then I was six. You're years from New ago. England. No one would know. No one would pick up on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right. <laughs> something gives me away. Uh, six years at Boston College. I was the associate head coach there. Uh, then our whole staff went to Ohio State. Um, 
I was there in Ohio State. The first year we won eight games. The second year we won 27 and went to the final four. So that was a kind sure. of a miraculous. That was Scooney Penn and Michael Red and that crew. I did that for three years and I was the head coach of William and Mary. I did that for three years and I went, actually went back to Ohio State. And then I transitioned from coaching into you know administration. I took over basketball for the Mid-American Conference first for about two and a half years out of Cleveland. And then uh, Delaney, Jim Delaney offered me the same position to oversee basketball uh, for the Big Ten. I did that for 12 years. And the uniqueness was, you know, usually it's just, you know, basketball, you're the liaison to the head coaches, you're head of, in charge of all operations, tournament operations, scheduling, television, stuff like that. But uh, Jim wanted me to kind of also rebuild the officiating staff. We had, you know, back in the day we had, Hillary and Steve Wellmer and Rick Hartzell and Hightower. And they were all in their mid sixties when I started. And so we had to start from scratch and kind of um, build a, an officiating program. So um, usually you do one or the other, you know, they usually bring in an ex referee, which is what they've got going now, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, that's a quick, quick uh, yeah. resume. So, you know, for the purposes of, of our listeners, we wanted to have you on because um, right, I, like any other year, there's been a string of things that have happened in the league, whether it's calls, whether it's controversies, whether it's coaches complaining off the court, on the court, everywhere. Um, and, and try to just kind of break this down, like the how the inner workings actually kind of play out in terms of the conference level. You know, our our audience is like super niche, big nerds, but they're all into this stuff. And one thing I want to kind of start on is like this idea of you know, social media changed the game. When it comes to how fans are familiar with officials and follow who these people are. Like before, I remember, you know, being a, a kid at A10 games, and there would be like two A10 officials that you'd recognize, and the, you know, the alumni would get on them, and and that would be it. And now people are charting officials, they know everyone by name, you know, reporters are saying who's calling the game pre-game from, from your vantage point. Point, like, can you kind of talk us through like realizing that happening in, in real time and if it how much it changed things for, for these guys? Yeah, well, it's all it's all television. You know, I mean, take the Big Ten. We have four network agreements this year. Uh, CBS, ESPN, Fox and Big Ten Network. Every single game in the entire year is nationally televised on one of those four networks. And if it's not big Fox, you know, or um, CBS, you know, it's FS1, uh, ESPN has ESPN2. We don't play too much on ESPNU anymore. But um, these referees, the top ones, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, off, off air, um, the NCAA tournament basically involves 100 officials out of probably a little over 1,000 nationally. So um, the top 10% are working – I'd say 80 to 100 games a year, and they're all independent contractors. They're not exclusive to any league. So, Brendan, if you work, uh, if you're, I don't know, Keith Kimball, and you work, um, you know, it's, it's a name fans will know. Uh, he works at probably, say, 90 games a year, and he works in the Big Ten, the Big 12, the Big East, the ACC, and the Pac-12. And, and those are on the busy nights. And then if he on the off nights, he might do a SWAC game or he might be within a couple hours of uh, a Southern Conference game, depending on where they are. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's kind of how it works. So so they are recognizable. And now you throw in social media and and the announcers that refer to them by name. Uh, some of them just have a recognizable look. You know, you you see a, a big, tall bald guy in the big 10 and you know that's dj carsonson you know you know right. they, you know they almost become cartoon characters <laughs> so it's it's exposure really and yeah. uh, and the fact that they're uh independent contractors allows them to probably be they overwork you mm -hmm. know they fly from they fly cross country night in night out um they're they're so recognizable because they're on national tv sometimes five days a week you know if not more so those guys and the idea of being overworked, I don't want to go too far down this well because we could probably have an entire segment just on that that topic. Um, but does like the league itself have any like limits or maxes of what a guy can work? 
Um, typically, nationally, the standard is for most of the coordinators, officials, you don't want the minimum you'd want a guy to see the same team is seven days. And ideally, it might be 10. And that's just because if uh, Dylan, if you worked at uh, in East Lansing last night and you happen to whack Coach Izzo with a technical foul, you, you really don't want to see him three days later. You know, <laughs> you hope that in seven days in the college schedule, he's already played two more games in seven days. So now you see him on the eighth day. He's had two other games. He he won't forget that technical, but um, but he's in a different frame of mind than if you had him back to back um, or twice out of, you know, two times in three games, you know, that type of thing. So we we try to avoid that in the scheduling. The problem, Brandon, is Brendan is um, you have to schedule them you know, early. Like a lot of the scheduling is done in the preseason. And so you get locked in and you have to give these referees their schedule because of travel, airline flights, rental cars, transportation. And then you're always manipulating things during the season with bad weather, things like that. So um, there's a lot of bells and whistles and tricks and things behind the scenes that the average fan just doesn't have access to. But a lot of it's just operational um, right. and the logistics of when they're working for your league. And then on the other nights, they're they're working for other conferences and where are they and what their travel is in and out of an arena, uh, especially when weather hits. So that's the same team twice in seven days. But what about is there any limit to like the number of games they can work if they're picking up from other leagues or how many games you'd want to see them work in a week, for example? Uh, yeah, it's tricky because um, let's say you're you're with a conference and the coaches are really high on an official nationally. You want to get them as many times as you can. The problem is um, what's your access to him? Cause he's an independent contractor. So Dylan, if you're what we call a primary official in the big 10, that means you will give your schedule to me first. Okay. So I look at October, November, December, January, February, March, and I have an open slate of games. So I try to get you as many times as I can without that repetition of seeing the same teams. Hmm. The issue is if I give you games like in the big 10, they almost play depending on the season, sometimes seven days a week with the, with the national TV contracts. So if I give you um, games Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you'll have seen eight different big 10 teams. Invariably on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there's no other team left because any other team you haven't had, the other six is going to play against one of those eight that you just had. So then what would happen is I would leave you open Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then you would go off because I didn't fill any of those dates. You'd go to the Big East or the ACC or what we call secondary leagues, and then you'd book your dates that way. So I, I might the most I might give somebody is 40 Big Ten games, 35, 40 Big Ten games from you know, mid-October when we start doing exhibitions um, till the first weekend in March. <laughs> and then you've got 35 games on your schedule. But like I said earlier, you're a nationally recognized guy, um, been in, you know, eight or 12 NCAA tournaments or advanced to the Sweet 16, Lead 8, Final Four. So you're in demand and you want to work 90 games. Um, and sometimes what I do you know, I was one of the first that started to combine the Big Ten with other leagues. So if you were at um, Michigan on Monday and Michigan State on Wednesday, I'd stick you in Eastern Michigan or Central Michigan on Tuesday. Then that way you could sleep in till 10 o'clock, get some rest. You only have to drive four or five hours over to Ypsilanti. Um, the trade-off is you decide whether you want that Mid-American Conference game in between the Big Ten. If you don't, because it pays fifteen hundred dollars less, right? So um, if you want Dylan, you can go do a game at South Florida, but you got to get to the airport at four forty-five a.m. in Detroit. Hope the weather's good. Fly to South Florida, um, and then come right back to Detroit and work in Lansing on Wednesday. So by strategically scheduling, I might pick off eight or 10 games for the Horizon League or the Mid-American Conference by ideally making um, your schedule uh, comfortable that way and allowing for some rest. But again, if you need the money or you're a little more on the greedy side and, and you don't want to give up 
10 games, which could be $15,000. Um, yeah. you just tell me, I, 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 thanks for that Eastern Michigan game, but I'm going to turn it back to you. I'm not going to take it. Is it like five grand for a league game then? Um, it's probably right now between 3,500 and four grand a game okay. at the highest level in the power conferences. But um, it depends on the reputation of the official. Um, and that's a flat fee, Brendan. It's like every, all in. That, that, that means the referee has to get his own airfare, his own rental car, his own hotel, and his own meals. Yeah, they're not they're not staying at the JW. They're, uh, they're well, going to they pocket they know that all cash. The, they know all the travel tricks. So <laughs> you want to ask them about Bonvoy points with Marriott <laughs> or the Hyatt. They know which point systems are the best. Um, they share rental cars, but they're, uh, they're frequent flyers. So they, they fly first class, not because you're spending the money because they've amassed so many points uh, with it, with the airline. Now you're, now you're speaking my language. So they okay. get all those perks that uh, you guys know about. <laughs> um, all right. So obviously things go wrong, right? Uh, missed calls, whatever. Coaches get pissed. Um, how does that process actually play out. So say, you know, there was the Rutgers situation with Ohio State, right? Where it's a missed call. Okay, now it has to be reviewed and it's kind of out of the you're not going to replay the game, whatever. How what happens when kind of things just kind of go off the rails like that? Well, typically what we say is you're paid for your judgment. Rules knowledge is assumed. So when it's rules related, we drop the hammer a, a lot stronger than just judgment call. You know, mm. a judgment call, bang, bang, charge, block. You got one second to decide, you know, and, you know, in that situation at the end of the Ohio State game with Rutgers, there were a couple things. You know, first, the kid dribbling the ball up the court, did he step out of bounds by a quarter of an inch or not? You know, first, the dribbler. It yeah. was really close. And Coach Peichel was standing right there looking at it. The problem is um, if you don't blow it out of bounds, it's a reviewable play by rule. But if you don't whistle it as out of bounds, you can't review it. So maybe he stepped out, maybe he doesn't. Now um, it was part B of that. Another player um, on Ohio State takes himself out of bounds, out of his own volition. He wasn't pushed out. He wasn't bodied out. He went, And then he runs back in as his – defender goes up to double team the ball. So I don't think he meant to do it, but by rule, that was a violation. He went out of bounds of his own volition. He came back in advantageous to himself and he received the pass. When you receive the pass uh, from the same ball handler that had the ball in your, in his possession, when you went out of bounds, you can't be the first one to touch it. Okay. Um, So that's a rule. But again, Usually that rule was written, guys, for baseline. Mm-hmm. Um, get, remember Gary Harris. Gary Harris used to run out of bounds on one side of the basket, go underneath the baseline and come out on the other side, and he'd come in bounds in such a way that he'd use the screen at a much better angle than he could get if he stayed in bounds. Mm-hmm. That was really the intent of that rule. To be honest, I'd never seen it happen on the sideline in 12 mm-hmm. years at, at the Big Ten. So it was a freaky thing. The problem was with social media and TV running multiple replays, none of those referees would even be looking at that ideally. But when you go to the monitor and you see it, you have to admit, yeah, that's by rule, that's a violation. Um, You know, and then the third part of that is you always have to check the time. You know, in that situation, when that free throw was missed, did the clock start on time? Because if that clock was a second late, the 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 game winning shot actually wouldn't have gotten off in time, so you dissect the whole play that way, and then you try to determine is this just poor judgment on behalf of referees, or just you know unlucky, you know wrong place at the wrong time, or a referee just got blocked out or he didn't see it, those type of things, or it's actually a a situation where they rule on something um, where they're actually wrong and they have time at the table and there's there's plenty of time to process it there's three of them out there and they still get the rule wrong in those situations we might um we might suspend them Hmm. so now your schedule goes up and now you're filling a spot but like so is it just like you miss a game or something like that or there's no yeah usually um you want to hit them in the pocketbook if you really want to send a message and that that usually is taking a game away so that's you know three to four thousand dollars 
right. and they learn, you know, that hopefully they'll learn their lesson. But the key to that is every time there's a mistake like that, um, you have to cut the play, you have to edit it, and you have to get it out to all of your officials. You don't want the same mistake to happen the next night. You know, so you're constantly teaching and training. Um, <laughs> that's one of the secrets, Brendan, is that it's an old boy network. And I mm -hmm. came in as probably only one of two ex-coaches to oversee officiating in the last 40 years. And they fought me every every step of the way. Like the old boy network immediately says, well, he he coached. He never refed. What does he know about officiating? You know, mm -hmm. and I'd say the same thing about, you know, uh, a student manager that is a student manager at Michigan or Michigan State or Indiana. And 20 years later, well, Tom Crean, 20 years later, becomes a head coach, maybe never played. Well, that means you can't ever be a coach. <laughs> so some of these guys would break my chops all the time, no matter how I do it. I did this for 10 years. I would break <laughs> down the officiating in every single Big Ten game for over a decade. And I'd still have these old cranky, egomaniac ex-referees <laughs> elsewhere in the country telling me I don't know what I'm doing. You know, ah, you didn't ref. So it's one of the ugly secrets. And it actually is one of the problems with the system. I can I because what I did is I tried to bring coaching to refereeing. Mm -hmm. I tried to bring data analytics. I tried, I brought video like you can't believe. Right. I mean, every morning, <clears throat> if you worked Michigan, Michigan State this weekend, by the next morning, you got a video montage of 15 to 18 plays, every mistake, every judgment call, every questionable call. And a lot of two thirds were good things like great call, really good, you know, good right. positioning. And and so, but that doesn't happen nationally. That was I was one of very few that do that because that was my, those were my chops when I was uh, you know coaching. Yeah, I mean I've been in an airport with an official like watching like re watching rewatching his plays like on the iPad you know sitting there waiting for a waiting for a flight. I was it was fascinating to see. Um, yeah, I mean people don't realize that these guys aren't just going to games one to another to another, but in the interim. Um, or in between, they are sitting there and they're rewatching the, the previous night's game. They're looking at other controversial calls. They're reviewing and viewing rules and et cetera, et cetera. Um, Dylan, do you have any questions on on that before I ask him the the good stuff about coaches getting mouthy? No, we can get into. <laughs> I think the coaching part is interesting. Let's get into that. Yeah. So, Rick. All right. Okay. So a coach comes out and either you know he blasts the guy on the court or he blasts the guy in the post game press conference. And, you know, it's woe is me. They're all they're all the world's biggest victims. Um, what happens at the conference level when it maybe goes too far? Well, it it's really starts with leadership. You know, um, Jim Delaney played college basketball at North Carolina for Dean Smith. Mm. So Jim had a totally different perspective <laughs> than, say, Commissioner Warren, that he played college basketball. But he you know, he's been spent close to the last two decades in the NFL. You know, so some of it depends on what the background of the commissioner might be. Um, the athletic directors are always defending their coaches. You know, they hired their coach. They want their coach to be successful. If their coach loses four games in a row, uh, a young AD that hired him doesn't look too good either. You know, so he's going to defend his head coach. Um, the coaches are going to try to say they're defending their players. You hear that lexicon all the time. You know, so... Um, Again, <clears throat> I think uh, there's always conversations going on. And I think because, like we said, now it's everything's nationally televised, the social media, um, you know, fans will take still shots, photographic images of a guy with like uh, a quarter of an inch of his foot out of bounds that gets missed. Or, I mean, it's amazing that the technology um, so, and everybody wants a pound of flesh, you know, especially when they lose. So you have to kind of wade through uh, all of that stuff. And uh, and you still have to be supportive of officials, too, because, I mean, the 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 expectations are that the goal is perfection when we know mm -hmm. that's not going to be the case. So a lot of times the coaches just need to listen to them. You know, me as an ex-coach, I knew exactly how it worked and when I was going to get a phone call. And I just you just have to let the coaches vent because that's really what they're doing. And they know that when they talk to you about officiating, they're not talking that they won't admit that their team turned the ball over 18 times. They they missed seven free throws. 
you know, and they shot 36 (laughs) percent from the field. And then if you look at the team stats, they've been they were outperformed in every team statistical category, (laughs) you know, (laughs) so it's the stress, you know, and it's like alumni. And now with NIL, every donor is on their ass and it's hard, you know, so um, it's it's kind of a it's all that all mixed into one cocktail, really. So I'm curious, we talk a lot on this pod about the Big Ten not winning a championship for so long and the style of play and how all that fits together. Do you think that the officiating ever influences the style of play in the league or does the style of play influence the officiating? And do you think there's a way to, is that kind of a subconscious bias that comes in from maybe some of the coaches in the league? Do you have any thoughts on how officiating can change and impact that because obviously like you said these refs all are working in other leagues they're all working in the NCAA tournament where we're talking about so it's interesting to think about the officiating piece of this and how that all fits together yeah it's a really good question Dylan I, I think um I think because like we mentioned the referees work all the leagues mm-hmm. um you know there's a chance that the west coast could be a little bit different because once you get out say west of Oklahoma or the Dakotas, whatever. It's hard for guys to work out West and in the Midwest a lot. I'll give you an example. Um, There's two or three big 10 referees that work primarily in the big 10 first and foremost, but they work the PAC 12 in the mountain West. What I have to do is I have, I would have to give them a whole week off once a month and they would go out West so that they didn't come back and forth with on red eyes constantly. Um, I didn't want that to happen. But they really they're really the same guys referring, I'd say, from the eastern east coast through the entire Big Ten, um, SEC, Big 12, Big East, ACC and Big Ten refs are, are typically all the same guys. So to say like the, the style of play in the Big Ten, that's going to be more produced by coaches and recruiting um, mm. than referees control in that you know narrative. I will say this, though. There is a completely different dynamic between the conference play and non-conference or multi-team events or neutral site events. Because once you get into the conference, everything ratchets up and it's like there's a built-in soap opera. In mm-hmm. other words, uh, the last two or three years in the Big Ten, we had all the nation's best big men. All of them. And so, you know, in the college game, if they get their second foul six minutes in, they sit for the entire half. So I would, as an ex-coach, I would be on the referees all the time. Like, if you if you're gonna hang two fouls on a guy on Zach Eady in the first ten minutes, they better be there because <laughs> one might be a little bit light, or one might be an over the back where you could have just give the ball out of bounds to the other team instead of calling the foul. So there's right. a lot of like nuance involved with some of that, and you we we would try to try to keep the better players on the floor if we could. You know, unless they just do something stupid or they commit their fouls. But I I was an advocate. We I actually made a proposal, Brendan, to the head coaches two years ago to change to a, a different fouling format, six fouls. Um, and hmm. basically what it was, was you could get uh, up to three in the first half. Um, if you got four fouls in one half, you'd be disqualified. And then uh, you could get six fouls for the game. So basically it was a system where you could get three fouls. You could keep playing with two fouls in the big 10 in the first half. Um, The other thing I'd say as an ex coach for 20 years, it's amazing to me that they just sit a guy down for 13 minutes and just hope they stay in the game. I mean, part of it's coaching. Why don't you tell your kid play zone? Or why don't you tell your kid, I don't care how many wide open layups you give you're more valuable to us on the court for another six or seven minutes than me sitting you for 13. But that never, it never comes up. Like the coach, like it's a, like it's a, it's a rule etched in stone. It's one of the 10 commandments of basketball. Thou shall not play in the first half with, you know, with two fouls. So, uh, so there's a lot of that that goes on behind the scenes and the, and the, you know, the coaches are always working the refs as soon as, you know, if a guy's got a second foul, you don't want him to pick up his third before the first media timeout in the second half. So everybody knows it. The referees know. I, I laugh when there's uh, the fouls are eight to one. Right. And the coach is going crazy. 
You don't think the referees know the fouls are eight to one? There's immediate stoppage every four minutes. You don't think they look <laughs> up at the scoreboard and they know what the foul count is? And so this was a thing with Wisconsin for years, Brendan, because they don't commit stupid fouls. They foul, but they don't, they never commit over the backs. They don't needlessly reach. They sit back, they play three-point line defense, and they pack it in. And then they they just basically body up to you and yep. make you make a shot. They never try to block your shot. Mm-hmm. So they'd be in the – for over a decade, they'd be the least fouling team in the Big Ten, and people would say, oh, it's ridiculous. You're not, no, it's coaching, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, when you were re- refereeing a Wisconsin game, if you want the fouls to stay relatively close – you cannot miss a foul that Wisconsin commits mm-hmm. because they're not going to commit needless fouls. So um, the referees always have their antenna up. If there's a reach in against Wisconsin, they're going to get it because if they don't, the foul count might go to six to two. And then, you know, the coach on the other end of the, he's going to start whining and work on the officials and all that. So there's all kinds of chess being played by coaches and interaction between coaches and referees and players. Uh, And that's why I say like the conference play is so intense compared to all the other games Um, and the league standings and, and all that is, is really intense. And so, you know, when, when coach McCaffrey staring at 0 and three the other day and his team comes back from 21 down to win, um, you know, those are the pressures and now the pressures on, uh, Coach Woodson, but he's got some injured players, you know, and so it, it's it's like you always have this whole um, media. It's not so much media; it's more student body, donors, uh, alumni, and they're either behind their coach or they're not, or they're happy or they're miserable, and they create a dynamic where it just puts a lot of stress and pressure on people, you know, the players and the coaches and people in the industry. So, all right, so technicals, right? There's, you see guys tear someone's face off and, and given is given the leeway. And then you see a guy, you know, shout something from across the court and get banged with one. And it, it turns out that's an accumulation of sins, essentially. Um, how do you weigh, um, you know, validity of technicals, quick triggers, double technicals, Um it seems like it's just a constant conversation. Well, the amazing thing is uh, for your listeners, why is the NBA so different than the NCAA? Like the mm. behavior of the coaches, you know, I mean, it's mind boggling. This is the first season in 17 years I've sat out and I sit back and I'm like, well, it's no surprise that Billy Donovan does well and Brad Stevens does well. Because there's other college coaches, you couldn't behave like that in the NBA. And you're coaching 24, 28, 32 year old men with families, and they're all millionaires, you know? <laughs> right. So the college game gets ridiculous. A lot of it's shtick. A lot of it is just for the TV cameras, you know? Um, so there are some automatics. Like you come way out of the box to protest a call onto the court. That's usually an automatic. You charge a referee, you know, and end up coming on the floor. That's usually automatic. A lot of the gyrating, you know, a lot of the wild swinging of arms or, you know, waving off a referee, gestures like that can lead to technicals. Those are kind of the the automatics and obviously, you know, brutal profanity. You know, I, I always laugh. There'll be a color analyst and he'll be like, I don't understand what that technical floor, that coach is completely calm. And it's like, well, yeah, but he just called, you know, he just used about four words like quietly under his breath, you know, that has to be a technical foul. <laughs> you know what I mean? But no one in the building looks like it. And, the, you know, the coach looks like a choir boy, you know. Um, the others are like, like you said, like uh, sometimes you might have a coach. He's just complaining about every single call, right, wrong, you know, judgment, it just never ends. And sometimes they just wear guys out that way and to the point where they have to call a technical foul just to say, coach, I'm doing my best out here. I'm, I'm like, every, you, you can't question every single call. It's getting ridiculous. You know what I mean? Or uh, they bring up a call that happened 10 minutes ago and they just won't let it go, you know? So sometimes it's hard to, as a viewer watching the games to know that that's all taken place. And then you you have the pressure on referees because of time and score. 
And you get in the last three minutes of a close game. I mean, a lot of times you just bite your tongue. You look the other way. You pretend you didn't hear something because now you're, you're impacting the, the players, you know, in the game. Um, he might be deserving of a technical foul, but, you know, you just played 39 minutes, you know, 39 minutes and 30 seconds. And, you know, two free throws and the possession of the ball is going to make make the difference and create a winner and a loser. So you have to you have to factor all that in as a referee. So I'm, I wanted to ask about if you have any thoughts on instant replay and if there's a way to do that better, because personally, I look at the NBA and I think there's less need to just scream up and down if you just have a coach's challenge that you can use. Then you look at college replay. I feel like it usually comes down to intricacies and what can and can't be reviewed, like the end of the Rutgers game, instead of, okay, can we get the call right? Like, I think the good example is ball goes out of bounds late in the game. They review for possession. It turns out that the defense actually just followed the offense, but then they overturn it because they can't call it. Do you think there's a better way to do replay in college, whether it's like a replay center for the Big Ten or something like that, that could, is that feasible at all? Yeah, I think that, well, for the power conferences is because they have the financial resources to have a, a replay center. We have a command center, for instance, in the Big Ten. Um, we hadn't gone for that. Uh, Commissioner Delaney was opposed to it. We did research one year in football, Dylan, mm-hmm. and we found out that even if we used the command center, we essentially refereed from there. There were only three or four plays in the entire season we would have changed. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so, but I, I do think um, that would help speed the reviews up. What, what I don't like in college is it's the, they're endless. They just drag on forever, you, you know, and usually that's not the referee's fault. It's like queuing up um, the right clip, getting the right angle. Uh, and a lot of times the producers in the TV trucks are faster than the people we have sitting courtside. You know, mm-hmm. um, one of the other things is just operations, Dylan, you know, in the big 10, they might be sponsored by TESO or whatever. You might have all the same timing equipment. It's the same age. You know, it's all two years old in the big 10. You might have one timing set of equipment at, you know, Northwestern, it might be 14 years old and at Rutgers, it might be brand new, okay. you know, so you, you have all these things where um, you're almost at the, at the point where you have to make all the table personnel working for the league office. That doesn't happen in college basketball. So you'll have guys that have been doing the time and the, uh, and the shot clock for 18 years, years at <laughs> yeah. Iowa or Indiana. <laughs> and you think like, there's no inherent bias in there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, that's a concern I would, you know, I would have for college as an ex administrator, you know, but that costs money now because mm-hmm. a lot of those guys might make a hundred bucks or they might even work for free, you know, cause they get a great courtside seat. Um, but anytime you're at the end of the game, you know, you always question that because I laugh, Brendan, you've seen this on video where either the home coach gets screwed by his own timer and he's pounding on the table or screaming at the guy, or it's reverse where obviously the visiting coach thinks he's getting homered, you know? So you got that, but to, to um, Dylan, going back to your question. Um, yeah. I think the to- the delays uh, are an issue and I'm a total proponent of coach reviews. I think in college basketball, if we added say, you know, two reviews a game, or, you know, one review in the last two minutes. Uh, I don't know. They'd have to figure out the data, uh, do a little research. But I think that would at least give a coach an opportunity to question something. And the the, um, the cameras and the technology is all there. Mm-hmm. So I, I do think that might save us from uh, a couple, you know, plays in a season where um, a bad call or a rules adjudication issue costs somebody a game. Speaking of costing someone a game, when it comes to guys kind of going over the edge um, or questioning things publicly, um, what what don't we see in terms of um, how the league handles that? Are are there are there under the table fines? Is there you know threats of suspension and things like that? Um, yeah, there's um, there's basically a sportsmanship code with every conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question is how that gets enforced. Again, it, 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 it relates to leadership of the conference office. You know, mm-hmm. so um, usually it's a, in the Big Ten, it's more like a three strike you know, process. It might be 
um, a reprimand that would be private, you know, maybe by phone or email or a letter. Then it could be um, a public reprimand or a fine. Um, it kind of ratchets up with regard to, you know, repeated behavior. Um, the tricky part, I think, in this day and age with social media is are, are the players, too, because um, they all have their own, you know, Twitter accounts and they could fire on referees themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, how are you going to manage coaches? I mean, um, for years, we just we just had a, a rule where you just couldn't talk about officiating in the post uh, game presser or you were going to be dealt with by Commissioner Delaney. That was just the way it was going to be. Um, so it depends, you know, change of leadership, different commissioners have different opinions about it. And then, like I said, the ADs are always weighing in to defend their guy too. Right. You know, I mean, uh, I'll give you an example. Like we had a situation where we had a coach chase referees off a floor, do some stuff in the back hallway that had to be addressed. (laughs) And then I get a call from an AD saying he doesn't want one of the three referees he doesn't want to see him on another game involving his team in the next 10 or 12 days. And I'm like, wait a second, the behavior of your coach, you don't want to address that. You're his boss. You know what I mean? Why is it that the referee, one of three on the game, can't referee your game in, you know, 10 days, 12 days. So, yeah. uh, so that's usually the case. <laughs> um, the strong ADs are, are of such that, um, they, uh, you know, they 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 know to have a little heart to heart with their coach, but others just defend them to their death. So, another question in terms of like kind of accountability um, that that often comes up, and I know, you know, as like you know, part of the board for like the USBWA, we go back and forth. So that's the United States Basketball Right Association for listeners. We go back and forth with the folks in Indianapolis about like how do we handle you know controversial calls in the NCAA tournament where you know in theory, got to get some kind of comment from an official, right? If it's the only, it's the biggest news and it changes the game, whatever. And there are like certain rules we can get access to um, an official and and get an answer as like a pool reporter. Um, And then other plays are designated as, you know, there will be no comment. So for example, last year, um, guy from Illinois hangs on the ring rim on the NCAA tournament, gets banged with a technical, it, you know, partially changed the game. I think it was the Houston game. Yeah. Illinois fans lose their shit, right? And so I, I was the pool reporter for that game. So I contact the NCAA. You know, we all go back and forth and do our thing. And it's ruled technical foul is a judgment thing by the official. That's not something that we get questions for. Um, it kind of is what it is. So a lot of times you hear fans say, though, you know, coaches have to have press conferences. Players have to have press conferences. Officials call the game, they leave. Um, and, and I understand why, but from your vantage point, you know, like, would that kind of be a Pandora's box situation if if every official could be questioned after games and things like that? Or how do you view that? Yeah, I think so. I, I think because it's such a thankless job, Brennan, like, in that situation, um, it was probably poor judgment. The pool reporter situation might get you the actual rule Mm -hmm. um of of you know specific to hanging on the rim um it wasn't a reviewable play if that was a coach's challenge that could have got rectified um if one of the other two officials with the calling official had you know bigger chops and stepped in and said hey let's just stop for a second okay the three of us need to get together you know, we're supportive of you, but are you sure you like that call? You know, yeah. like yeah. think about it for a second. I'd like <laughs> to see that type of teamwork amongst referees, but mm-hmm. the other two might not want to step up and be, they might want to be, you know, nowhere near that play because that referee likely didn't advance to the next round in the NCAA tournament, <laughs> you know? So most of it gets handled behind the scenes, yeah. but I think to scrutinize them to su- such a degree where they got to give press conferences or they got to have a public statement. I think you, you know, the, cause the reality of it is nationally, we we're at a crisis. We no young people want a referee at mm. the youth level. So you won't see it now and you might not see it in football and basketball cause it's lucrative, 
But in all these other sports, you know, the soccer, the field hockey, the little crosses, you can't find referees. I mean, if you have sons or daughters that play sixth, seventh, eighth grade sports, I mean, good luck. It's usually a retiree, you know, hmm. um, very few young people, I'd say between the ages of 18 and 24, want to want to get into officiating these days because of the scrutiny and crazy parents at the youth level. So, you know, I worry about overexposure that way. I, I applaud the NBA. I mean, they they try to be as transparent as they can. They even have that uh, two point uh, last two minute report. You know, it's on a website, but I don't even think the average fans even go to it because it doesn't change anything, really. You know, and we and actually I've seen some NBA players. I think LeBron was one. There might be some other stars that are like, What's the point? The refs have a tough job. Do we really even have to have a report the last two minutes? So I, I don't know. Those I'm not sure where I stand on that. Yeah. I have wondered if they're, you know, if, if coaches, it's one of those things you, you they only complain, you know, and I, and I have wondered if sometimes uh, just occasionally if a coach will come out and be like, you know, that was a really well officiated game or something like that. Just kind of take the temperature down because it does seem there's like there's so much vitriol and venom and now you know average fans know these guys names and they're you know you'll hear just a random alumni who had six beers you know screaming at larry you're just like who's that guy (laughs) well that's funny you say who's that it's funny you say who's that guy coach the college coaches traditionally look at referees as security blankets Mm. so i'll give an example um there was a a 65-year-old referee working a Big Ten game probably, say, eight or ten years ago, and he was right at the end of his career, and he couldn't run, really. Mm. But um, the coaches always rated him highly because they trusted him, especially mm. if you were on the road. They were like, this guy's not going to get punked out by anybody. There could be 18,000 fans you know, screaming at him. He's just going to call what he, you know, what he sees or whatever. The problem was, excuse me, late in his career, he couldn't cover the court. Mm. And so, you know, there are times where he'd be, you know, we call leaking out, like he'd be a trail official, the furthest referee from the basket. And, you know, if it was against uh, Michigan State, you know, Tom wants to run on makes and misses. So that guy, before the ball was even secured on the backboard, he might already be running, trying to run down court to get ahead of the play. Mm. And, I had a conversation with Tom Izzo about it because um, might have been back in that same era with Gary Harris. There were three times in the game where Gary went to shoot a shot, a three pointer and got tapped on the elbow or the wrist. But the referee was behind the matchup. Mm. It, no, he has no look at it where my teaching and training was you want to be right alongside the play and look between the two players to see if there's contact on the shot. Well, he was incapable of covering the court that way. But this guy, regardless, would be rated high by both of the coaches in the Big Ten. And I'd have to show them film and say, wait a second, Tom, he might have cost you nine free throws in the game. Because I think Gary got tapped on the wrist three times and it affected his jump shot. And then you start, especially as an ex-coach, talking to coaches about it. We start to have really good dialogue about it. But, Mm. But most of the coaches at the college level, they would rather have the name guy And I completely disagree because um, the young up and comer might be still 46 years old. He's not young, but, and he spent a decade in the Mac, the summit horizon. He's worked their conference tournaments. He, he or she, they're more than good enough to referee big 10 games, but the old, the old boy network, they also protect themselves and they keep rolling out the same referees. And you can't tell me that, a final four referee that's 52 years old is just as good at 63 years old in FIBA. You cannot referee over the age of 50 and in FIBA. Wow. Yeah. And in FIBA internationally, you have to do what's called a beep test. You oh, have yeah. to pass a running physical test. And uh, Jim Delaney and I used to talk about this because um, I said, Jim, why can't I give the referees a physical test just to see what their conditioning's like? And because they're independent contractors or uh, the threat of lawsuits, you know, um, he'd say, well, we'll probably get sued. You know, we could afford taking them on because it's the right thing to do. But no one at the college level has ever really done that. You know, um, so, you know, I think the reality there is, you know, we haven't even addressed 
age and mobility because you're afraid of age discrimination lawsuits. But firefighters have to carry that hose up three flights of stairs and they have a physical testing that you have to pass. And so I think ultimately, you know, if it was college basketball, say we probably could win that lawsuit against age discrimination because of the physical nature of the job, Mm -hmm. but no one's wanted to address it. And so what my strategy was, as I was dealing with aging referees, I would reduce their schedules to the point where they got the message that they weren't getting the schedule that they always got and they need to think about wrapping up their career. But this is coming, Brendan, from an ex-coach. And yeah. those that old boy network would come after me like you can't believe or, you know, guys would try to threaten me. And I, I would break it down on video and I'd be like, no, it's about performance. It's not about age. It could be about mobility related to age, but you're also valued for your rules, knowledge and your experience. So there's a sliding scale there. But for a lot of college basketball, when you watch these games on national TV, you'll also see referees that have had double knee replacements. I mean, they can't even run. They're limping, you know. And then the other thing, because it's lucrative, you pull your hamstring, Brendan, and you don't tell me because you got another, you know, $3,800 game the next night. And so – I would threaten firing referees if they didn't tell me what their physical status was. If they tweaked a hammy, I, I would let them maybe try. I'd get them treatment from the trainer at the next school the next day. They'd be in the training room in the morning and I'd get an assessment back. But I needed to set up a plan B in case they couldn't Holy go. Smokes. Yeah. So if a referee <laughs> didn't tell me, that would be a suspension, you know, behind the scenes no one would ever hear about. But, Damn, you know, that's next the good time stuff, you see, this uh, is why we time, have you on. <laughs> yeah. Next time you see a referee in a college game hobbling, ask yourself this question. Is he hurt? Has he had a knee replacement or is he just old and ready? You know, should he just not be out there? You know, because it all relates to court coverage. But again, if that guy has an 18 year relationship with, you know, Fred Hoiberg or something, you know, right. I mean, I mean, I'm just throwing coaches names up. Right. I mean, Those coaches feel like, hey, I know the guy. I can talk to the guy. I trust the guy. They're not even talking about really assessing performance and breaking down video and looking at play calling. And the coaches, they don't have time for it because they're they're scouting and there's three days before game between games. And so uh, one of the problems I have with coaches as an ex coach is that they just don't give it enough time and they're not really giving you facts. You know, about, you know, they'll say, I never want to see this referee again. And I'll be like, well, I graded him out. He had three incorrect calls. Two of them were in the first half. It had no impact on the play or the game or scoring. And maybe one one call cost you a bucket or an in one. But I mean, really, you don't want to ever see yeah. him again. I mean, that's <laughs> not going to happen. You know? Well, well, this was awesome, Rick. You are officially the uh, Mike Pereira of this uh, this podcast moving forward. Uh, might ask you to come on and explain some things uh, in, in the future. But I hope this helped listeners because it is it is one of those things where, you know, I feel like it, it's such a reactionary thing. We see things and, and don't maybe take time to consider the layers underneath it. Um, Dylan, you got anything on the way out? No, this is awesome. Thanks a lot for taking the time. I yeah, dude, you're it. like you're like one you might be the only inter- person who's been interviewed on this podcast we've been doing this for i don't know how many years dylan four years i think and it's four years big I don't think had, for us just bantering back and forth it's, it's good <laughs> we've had a couple idiot writers on maybe but no one no one certainly of your stature rick you know well i'm i'm uh certainly impressed by that but uh <laughs> it's the but, highest you know, honor it's like well, I have to remind, you know, we say this to fans all the time. What is fan? Where did that come from? Well, yeah. obviously it's short for fanatic. When you when you have a dog in the or a horse in the race, it it does uh impact you. So if you're watching the football game last night and you want to complain about officiating, you're not a fan of either team, you're you're probably pretty objective. As soon as you start rooting for one of those two, or your friends are the coach, or you have a player that is a, your friend or relative or it's hard to see it objectively, you know, and uh, I think um, it's the thing that I don't like about it is it gets used as an excuse all the time. Like oh, yeah. there might be 140 possessions, guys, in a in a basketball game. And to be honest, 
after a decade of grading the games and grading officiating, we would average about six mistakes a game in 140 possessions. It averages out to about two plays per ref. And that way you'd know if a referee had five mistakes or six, you know, you really have a heart to heart with them and you go over video and stuff, but they're really very good. And when you think about all the offenses and defenses and strategy, or whatever, it's just a built in excuse. That's easy to talk about all the time that, you know, yeah. we just got screwed and we, and we lost because of the referees, you know? And so um, it does happen on occasion, but I think people just have to do a little bit of a deeper dive or step back a little bit. And even in the missed calls in any sport, you have to take almost like a forensic approach to it. Like, well, mm -hmm. why did they miss it? Where were they standing? A lot of times on the video, on the TV screen, you can't see where the referees are. So we have to piece together multiple angles. And um, when we would do, when I would cut up, send cut ups, um, even my, I had a whole team of video editors and I would look for the money shot. Like we have seven or eight, 10 camera angles on every big 10 game. And invariably there would only be one angle that proved that that referee missed the call. And that's mm -hmm. the video that he would, or she would see the next morning, you know, in the other right. six or seven camera angles, you, you really couldn't tell it. And sometimes one camera angle to the other, the play, especially like on a charge block play look completely different, you know? So where right. a referee is standing on the court, you know, sometimes has an impact. So it's, I'll leave, you'll, you'll like this. So I don't know anything about field hockey, anything, right? But my sister's the head field hockey coach at Penn and has been for years and was a coach at a different college for that in high school. Anytime I go to any of her games, my move is I stand on the sideline, you know, and if there's a play in front of me and the call goes against Penn, I yell to the official, you were out of position to make that call. And I just assume I'm right because I probably am right. And I, I don't have to know the rules, but I can still, you know, I just want to get in that official's head just a little bit. So advice to the fans, don't yell at the call, you know, get real psychological, tell that official they're out of position because it might make them second guess himself. So they're timing their sprints up and down the court. <laughs> yeah, no, it, the, the comments are hilarious because now, you know, actually, when I when I started in the Big Ten, Brennan, within the first three or four years, Michigan was one of the first that put seats on the sideline on the mm -hmm. sides of the benches. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, you see it in the NBA. Sometimes it's hard to know which is a fan and which is a coach along the sideline. Um, so some of the things that happen with fans right on that the front row, <laughs> I mean, invariably, I have to communicate with um, the game operations staffs because what happens a lot of times in the big 10, that might be a multi multi million dollar donor. Mm -hmm. And the guy's a complete jerk you know, <laughs> says something, or says something, you know, <laughs> racial or something ridiculous, you know, and we have to, we're trying to get a guy thrown out in the staff of the institutions. Like, well, that's going to be tricky. <laughs> and it's like, we didn't say he has to leave the building, put him up in a suite, you know what I mean? But he can't sit there and abuse the referees or yell at the opposing players, you know? So I love it. Uh, operationally, love it. there's always a million things going on. Well, this was great, Rick. Um, really do appreciate uh, the time and uh, you're the man. And it's weird not seeing you out there on the road, but hope hopefully we, uh, we cross paths soon. But thank you for doing this. No, my pleasure. Anytime. All right, that'll wrap it for this week. Make sure you join uh, the moving screen next week. We'll be back with more Big Ten coverage. And uh, that's it. Thanks. Cheers.